Good evening, everyone. My name is Carver, and I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Dry Eye, Getting the Most Out of Your Oculus Keratograph 5M. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Enter in your questions at any time, and uh, we'll discuss them at the end of tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Thomas Wyshewski. He is a 1987 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Uh, Dr. Wyshewski has, a, has specialized in contact lenses over three decades, and he earned his fellowship from the International Academy of Orthokeratology in 2009 and served on the board of, of American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control from 2009 to 2019. He is the former host of the Academy's OrthoK podcast series, and he has served as the co-host of the annual Vision by Design Bootcamp for Beginners and has lectured extensively on orthokeratology and myopia control. And uh, recently, uh, he has uh, kind of moved a lot of his practice focus over to dry eye and uh, kind of kind of the combination of uh, kind of contact lenses and dry eye. And he's been practicing in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for the past 15 years where he has built a successful ortho-K myopia control and dry eye practice. And Dr. Shefsi, yeah, again, has recently added that uh, dry eye program to his practice. So thank you so much, Dr. Shefsi. I am uh, very excited for your presentation tonight. Thanks for the introduction, Carver. And good evening, everybody. Tonight, I want to talk to you about um, really two of the hottest topics in all of eye care today, um, myopia control and dry eye. And while I've lectured extensively on, on myopia control and orthokeratology, tonight we're going to really focus on the dry eye part of the equation. And by the, the end of this presentation, you'll understand why I made that decision. But realize that the Oculus Keratograph 5M can be your gateway into providing both of these different services. And I'm gonna tell you how I use the 5M in my practice and help you decide if these services are right for you, if there's something you may wanna to add to your practice. I also think it's important to understand why this topic has suddenly become so hot. Now, I've owned the Keratograph for about two years, and in that time, it has become the single most influential piece of equipment I have ever owned in 34 years of practice. And I mean that both in terms of patient satisfaction and ROI. That's a bold statement, I know that. But by the time I'm through, I think you're gonna agree. And it's really kind of crazy for me to say that, especially considering that most practices don't even own a single corneal topographer, yet I had already owned two others. I have one that's a topographer, keratometer, autorefractor, aberometer, that's part of our refraction system, and another one that I've used for about 15 years to design specialty lenses and ortho-K lenses. So why add a third? I mean, that sounds kind of crazy. Well, I was absolutely convinced of the keratograph's dry eye capabilities. And the fact that I could also use it to design contact lenses using the Wave um, contact lens design platform was just icing on the cake for me. Tonight, I'm going to begin with the why. Why would you want to use the keratograph the way I do? I'll give you some historical perspectives. Then I'll tell you exactly how I have implemented the keratograph in my office, how I use it both for dry eye screenings and full dry eye workups and how using the 5M has created a paradigm shift in the way that I manage my dry eye patients. And finally, I'm gonna tell you exactly what impact the keratograph has had on my practice, and I'm gonna back up that bold statement that I opened with. And of course, as Carver said, just put your questions in, I'm happy to take them all at the end. So the first thing is, why should you care? All right, why should you care about treating dry eye? Well, that's a really pretty good reason because dry eye hurts. It's affecting the majority of your patients and they are living with pain and many of them don't even bother to complain because they just assume that it's a normal part of aging. You can help them, but right now these people are in your chair and they're going uncared for. Now, how do I know this? Well, it was happening in my own practice and I didn't realize that the magnitude of this problem until I actually started to look for it. Now, 
when it comes to the magnitude of the problem, you have to understand that dry eye is the most common reason for patients to seek care from an eye care practitioner, the symptoms of dry eye, I should say. A 2005 Gallup st survey said that 92.5 million Americans suffer from dry eye. A 2009 Gallup survey said that 81% of these people were extremely frustrated. And the reason they were extremely frustrated is they wish there was something more effective to treat their dry eye. I mean, let's face it, that historically the treatment for dry eye was just to reach up onto into your sample closet, grab a bottle of artificial tears and hand it to the patient. You know that doesn't work and they know it too. I'll give if if patient care isn't enough for you, do you care about your practice? All right. Our practices are constantly under assault with the increase in regulatory burdens, the never ending cuts in managed care reimbursements, increasing competition from online retailers. Our practices are under assault from every single angle. And why should you care? TBL, the bottom line, because your bottom line is being eroded every day by all of those things that I just mentioned. And if you're practicing just standard optometry the way we have done for decades, you're really being hurt by these factors. So we have to look at, I'm gonna use um, a metaphor here. I really like this. Um, what are the pillars that support your practice? All right, so look at pillars that support the Parthenon. This building has stood for almost 2,500 years. Those pillars are still holding up the structure. They're still there. The whole building would still be there, except that about 500 years ago, uh, the Turkish army was using the uh, Parthenon as an ammunition dump, and it blew up, and that's what destroyed the building. But for over 2,000 years, that building stood. Those pillars are still standing today. So what are the pillars that support your practice? I'm gonna look at this a little bit historically. Originally, optometry had only one pillar to support it, and that was the sale of eyewear, and that was it. That was true up until 1919, but something extraordinary happened in 1919. Very courageous optometrist from Dallas, Texas, Fred Baker, had the audacity to actually charge a patient for an eye exam. It cost him dearly. He was promptly arrested, prosecuted, convicted, fined, and jailed for practicing medicine without a license. Fred was truly an optometric martyr because it cost him most of his patient base, it cost him his personal health, his, his family connections, and it took about a year but in 1920, his conviction was overturned and suddenly optometry had another pillar, exam revenue. And it largely stayed this way for the next 30 years or so till about 1950 when suddenly contact lenses became a thing. And we added a third pillar. Now some practices, this is all they're doing, but Around 1980, we added a fourth pillar, and that was medical care. But these are all the things that are being eroded by competition and regulatory burdens and cuts in uh, third-party reimbursements. In my own practice around 1990, I went big into specialty contact lenses and ortho-K. Now, myopia control wasn't even a phrase in those days, but ortho-K does control myopia, so I was doing myopia control even back then. And over the course of the next 20 years or so, those two specialties became the largest pillars of my practice. In 2019, though, I decided to make a change. I added the keratograph, and I added a dry eye pillar. Now, in 2019, dry eye represented less than 1% of practice revenues. I added the keratograph 
and several other pieces of equipment just to treat dry eye. By the end of 2020, dry eye had become 19% of my practice revenues. This year, that has grown to 22% year to date. So dry eye has really come on strong. Let's get some historical perspective about dry eye. Historically, the approach is simply to do one thing, and that is to treat symptoms. Many of our colleagues are still doing it exactly this way today. Those treatment modalities, simply over-the-counter artificial tears, punctal occlusion, and then about 16 or 17 years ago, we had the advent of the first prescription medication for dry eye, Restasis. All of these treatment modalities were designed to do one thing. Perhaps Restasis was designed to go a little bit further, but up until this point, everyone has only treated symptoms. And I have to share with you a Facebook post. I took off of Facebook uh, just a couple of months ago. And this doctor is asking for help. He has tried everything on this patient. He's tried sustain complete. He's tried retain. He's tried ointments at night. He's tried a brooder mask. He's done lipoflow. He uses Theratiers. He does lid scrubs, autologous serum. He's ordered a Sjogren's test. He's already failed with Restasis, Sequa, Zydra, and had some temporary relief with Oxervate. He's considering sclerols and Isuvis. Now, I gotta tell you, I gotta give him credit because he's really working his heart out just trying to fix this patient, trying to help them. But it seems like he's just throwing darts at a board. His treatment modalities are all over the place. He really was trying to treat symptoms. That really isn't what you need to do. You need to get to the problem and you really want to treat the root cause of those problems. And these are four of the most common, blepharitis, MGD, aqueous deficiency, lid function problems. There are certainly others, but you have to get to the root cause. And that's really the key to treating dry eye. And that's where an instrument like the Keratograph 5M comes into play. You have tremendous diagnostic capabilities here. The, this instrument will give you more than 20 different scans of the tear film and the eye and, and the effects of dry eye. And you need to screen your patients. You need to screen everyone. So I'm gonna go through exactly how I use the Keratograph 5M for screening. Now, I'm gonna play a video here, um, so I will apologize, the video may come out a little bit choppy, but uh, if you have issues with it, it will be repaired in the uh, recording, so when they post the recording, it'll look a lot better, it'll, it'll run smoothly. Let me just turn my webcam off here, so get that out of the way. And I'm going to play the video, and I'll be back. Okay, let's talk about how we use the Keratograph 5M as a screening device in our office. First off, we screen absolutely every single comprehensive eye exam patient as just part of our normal routine. There is no additional charge for this screening but we screen, screen absolutely every single adult over the age of 18 and children if they're under the age of 18 and symptomatic we will screen them as well now i do get some disagreement with screening everyone and i've got to tell you in my experience that you really do need to screen everyone and the reason is really simple as we get older many of us have been to many doctors and have been told multiple times just to use some artificial tears and it really never works as you are well aware they may not bother to tell you simply because they fear you're just going to tell them to use another bottle of artificial tears and they know it doesn't work 
The other reason, and this is probably more common, and those of you who are over the age of 50 will understand exactly what I'm talking about. As we get older, there are certain things that begin to happen, and we just accept them as being a normal part of aging. And your eyes feeling drier, grittier, uh, maybe having some intermittent blur, we just assume that's a normal consequence of aging. Those people will not mention it to you because they feel there's really no point. It's, it's normal and that's what I should expect. They're suffering from, from dry eye needlessly. So again, I would tell you to screen everyone because you're going to catch a lot of those people who won't bother to mention it to you. Now when we screen, my text will take the patient through their normal pre-exam procedures and do the keratograph on them. That whole process takes them just really about two or three minutes to enter their name and date of birth in the keratograph software and then capture four images per eye. And the four images I have them capture are, number one, they capture the tear meniscus height. That'll tell me about the volume of tears in the eye. They capture the lipid layer profile. And that really will tell us, do they have myobian gland disease? Are they producing any oil? They capture a redness score, which tells me a little bit about an inf inflammation, and they do myography. And just those four scans really is all I need to get an idea of whether or not this patient needs more of a workup. So I'm gonna go through those scans with you as though you were a normal patient, and I'll explain them one by one. So here we go. Okay, Mr. Patient, let's take a look at the scans of your tear layer. First, we're going to look at the volume of tears in your eyes. Your lower eyelid acts like a dam holding a reservoir of tears back up against the eye. I want to know the depth of that reservoir. And so we measure it. And here you can see your tear reservoir. And yours is 0.37 millimeters deep. The normal range is anything from 0.26 to 0.35. So 0.37, you're perhaps just a little bit more than we would expect to find, but really that's not a problem. So this part is good. You've got plenty of tears in your eye. This is looking at the oil layer in your tear film. And here what we want to see is an iridescent rainbow of reds and blues, maybe some copper color uh, that appears after each blink. That Oil layer is produced by glands here at the base of your eyelid, in the, both the lower and the upper lid. And it spreads out, floats on top of the water layer of your tear film, protects it from evaporating, and it also lubricates the eye. If you don't have enough of the oil, or if the oil is poor quality, you can have all the water in the world and that eye will never truly be wet. And here we can see you really don't have any oil visible. Let's look at the redness of your eye. Here, the computer looks at the white part of your eye and measures how much red it sees. And it gives us a number, a numeric value. Your redness score is 1.5. Normal amounts of redness would be anything from 0 to 0 0.5. So at 1.5, you're three times redder than we want you to be. Redness is a measure of inflammation. So you do have some inflammation here. The last scan I want to look at today is the glands that actually produce that oil layer. And this is an infrared image of the inside of the lower lid in your left eye. And you can see these white structures here. These are the glands that produce that oil layer. And you can see that you have some glands missing over here and maybe here. I'm going to show you what a normal set of glands would be. And I'm going to compare your eye to some reference images that we have. So this is your eye up here. This would be a normal, healthy set of glands in the eyelid. And as we move to the right, they become progressively less healthy until we get here. And you can see most of the glands have died and the few that are alive are all shortened and struggling. And this is you. You don't wanna be this person. Once the glands are gone, they're gone for good and we cannot resurrect them. This person is miserable, they're that person with that bottle of artificial tears in their hand continuously, and they are not a happy camper. You don't want to be that. I'm going to recommend that we bring you back and do a comprehensive dry eye evaluation on you. 
and uh, my technician can schedule that for you on the way out. And that's it. We do that with every single patient. I already know that this patient's got an issue, and I'm going to bring them back and look a little bit closer. But that's our screening process. Okay, so once we have the patient screened and we, we schedule them to come back, we're going to do a comprehensive dry eye evaluation on them. This is a paid visit. Uh, we do charge for a, um, a level three visit and as well as uh, charge an extra out-of-pocket for the crystal tear report, which is part um, of the software that you can get with the 5M. So I'm going to play this one. This also has a video. This one's a bit longer uh, because it does take me longer to do the comprehensive evaluations. But I'm going to get myself off the screen here and get the video rolling for you. Okay. Now that we've gone through how we use the keratograph as a screening device, let's talk about how we use it for a comprehensive dry eye evaluation. Typically, this appointment is going to be scheduled some point after their comprehensive eye exam, usually a few weeks later. And in this exam, we're going to do a series of scans with the keratograph. We're going to do a couple of, of other things as well. Initially, when we first started using the keratograph, I used every scan that it could do. And it can do more than 20 different scans. It's a ton of information. Well, what I found in my practice was that it just really wasn't practical to use all those scans. So I have slowly, over the past two years, whittled down the number of scans that we do to the seven that I feel are most essential. And Really, I can get a very good picture of what's going on with just these seven scans. Now, I will also augment these scans because I have anterior seg imaging in the exam lane. I will often do things like lysamine green staining and fluorescine staining chair side. The keratograph is in, a, in the pretest room, and that is run by the technicians. And I really don't like having them instill anything in the eye until I've seen this patient. But typically, they will do the keratograph, do an OSDI score on them, and take a history, ask them to show us what treatments they've used previously or are currently using. And then I will come into the room and review their, their results with them. So let's take a look at the scans that I actually use. And I will then go through this just as though you were a normal patient, just like we did with the screening. Again, for the first test we're going to use, we're going to look at their tear meniscus height. We're going to next look at their nick butt, their non-invasive breakup time. I find that's very helpful. We will once again look at their um, lipid layer looking for that oil. Again, a redness score. Then we're going to look at the lid margins more closely. I'm really looking for blepharitis here, both the lower and the upper lid. And finally, we're going to take a look at that mybography again. And I was having the techs do the upper lids. They have, they tend to struggle with that. I found that it was just easier just to let them do the lower lids. And if I see something that I want to look more closely at, I will then do the uppers. After reviewing these scans, I will use a mybomian gland evaluator and really see what comes out of these glands. I'm looking to score the secretions that I get out of the glands. Zero being a perfectly normal gland uh, with clear expression. One being slightly turbid expression. Two being a more thickened expression coming out of those glands, three being basically pus coming out of the glands, and four glands are totally inspissated and there's nothing coming out. So let's go through these scans and see where we're at. Okay, Mr. Patient. So we're going to take a look at the scans of your eyes and we're going to start here with your left eye. So these are all the scans we took and I'm going to go through them one by one. 
First, we're going to go through the tear meniscus height. Your lower lid acts like a dam holding a reservoir of tears back up against it. And I like to know how deep that reservoir is. The vast majority of patients who suffer from dry eye disease have plenty of moisture in their eyes. And in fact, a great number of them have excessive moisture in their eyes. And they think it's kind of crazy when I tell them they too are suffering from dry eye, even though they're coming in with handfuls of soaking wet tissue and tears running out of their eyes. It is very rarely a volume issue. It is much more commonly a, an issue with the quality of the tear film. But having said that, we want to measure the volume of tears. And in your left eye, your tear reservoir is 0.33 millimeters deep. Perfectly normal. That's exactly what we want to see. Now, when you blink and your lids come together, and when your upper lid goes up, it's almost like your windshield wiper making a swipe. Unlike a windshield wiper, though, lids don't take the moisture away. They simply smooth out that tear film. There's a very thin layer of fluid across the surface of your eye. And eventually, it's going to evaporate. It's going to break down. You're going to develop some dry spots. In a normal, healthy tear film, that process should take between 20 and 25 seconds. If the tear film breaks down more rapidly than that, that creates problems. If it breaks down quicker than 10 seconds, those are people who are usually pretty symptomatic. When we measure your tear film breakup time, it is just under 10 seconds. It's at just over eight and a half seconds. So that really explains a lot why you're having difficulty. It, that'll also give you fluctuating vision. You know, those times when you look at something and it's clear for a moment, then it goes blurry and you blink and it clears up again. That's not your prescription changing, that's your tear film breaking down. Next, we want to look at the lipid layer or oil layer of your tear film. This layer is produced by glands along the lid margin up here and down here along the lower lid. With each blink, the pressure of the blink should squeeze out tiny droplets of this oil. This oil should be very loose, about the consistency of olive oil, and clear in color. Because it's oil, it floats on top of the water layer of your tear film. When it does this, it has a very characteristic appearance. It should look like an iridescent, iridescent rainbow of reds and blues. It should look more like this. And you can see we have this bluish iridescence here, a little bit of copper color. That's a really nice, healthy oil layer in this tear film. And when we look at your eye, we can see that there is no oil there. There may be a little bit of thickened secretion. You can sort of see right here and a little bit here, but that's not going to keep that eye wet. Next, we look at a redness score. Here, the computer is looking at the white part of your eye and measuring how much red it sees. Redness is just a measure of inflammation. The other thing we can see when we can look at this is that you know your redness score is 1.9. A normal amount of redness is anything from 0 to 0 0.5. So you're nearly four times redder than normal, and that is due to inflammation. It could be due to dry eye most likely, but it could also be due to allergy, or perhaps if you had a rough night last night, that can also make this happen. When we look here, you can also see this yellowish discoloration along the lash line. In the, upper, in the upper lid and a little bit here in the lower lid. We don't have a great picture of the lower lid here, but you can see this discoloration. That is a biofilm, and we'll get a closer look at that in a moment. When we look more closely, you can see it here, okay? This is a biofilm. Now, what the heck is a biofilm? You deal with a biofilm every single day of your life, and that is the plaque on your teeth. It's caused by staph bacteria, and this Myofilm builds up and just adheres to the, the eyelid very, very tenaciously. It sticks on there almost like crazy glue. Really difficult to get it off. And it harbors more and more staph bacteria. That bacteria can build up along here, and then it can get find its way down into these glands along the eyelid margin that produce that oil layer. And you can see there's a gland here, there's a gland here. All these little spots, they're all glands. If 
bacteria finds its way down into those glands, they're going to become inflamed. The secretions which should come out of them, which should be loose and clear, and the consistency of olive oil, begin to thicken. First they'll get cloudy, and then they'll thicken further. Eventually they'll be they'll congeal so much that they'll be almost like toothpaste coming out of there, and then they can congeal completely. When that happens, that material turns rancid, which then becomes toxic to the gland structure, and the glands begin to die off. So we really want to avoid that. Let's take a look at your upper lid. Again, we can see here, this is the pore for each one of these glands. Okay. Let's take a look at the glands themselves in the lower lid. And again, I'm going to compare these glands to some reference images that we have. And here you can see a normal, healthy set of glands. As we move from left to right, they become progressively less healthy. And this is you. And we can slide this anywhere along here. You know, and I would say you're pretty much around here. Um, you've lost some gland structure here. You can see this gland is missing. These are a little bit distorted that is going to cause problems. That's why you're not producing the oil layer. That's why your tear film is breaking down so rapidly. That's why your vision is fluctuating. We need to address this. We need to do something to help preserve the function of these glands for the rest of your life. At this point, I'm going to use the meibomian gland evaluator and express their glands and see what comes out of them, and then show them an image of that. Typically, I will use the anterior seg imaging on my slit lamp and record whether I'm getting clear oil. If I do, that's wonderful. Usually, we're gonna get something turbid coming out, perhaps no expression at all, and that's usually enough to show the patient. The value of the keratograph really is in being able to put these images together one after another to tell the story of their dry eye. It's just that simple. You can tell patients anything you want, but once they see the images for themselves, it finally gets in and they understand. And they're going to, at that point, usually be very willing to accept whatever treatment plan you offer them. But understand, it is being able to demonstrate. This is show and tell. You want to make it very simple, very clear. And these images are basically all you're ever going to need to show them. It'll help them understand what's going on. Now, typically, after I show them these images, I'll then talk to them about the things that we're going to recommend that they do, whatever my treatment plan might be, whether it's nutritional supplements or home therapy or in-office therapy. Uh, there are lots of different ways to go here, depending on what treatment protocols you have employed in your office or that you wish to employ. And I'll create a treatment program that is very comprehensive beginning with nutritional support with an omega-3 supplement or hydro eye or something like that and continue into home hygiene, lid hygiene, perhaps some warm compresses and then whether or not it's LipaFlow or IPL or tear care or LLLT, uh, there's a whole gamut of options that I have at my disposal and this has made us very successful. The, the beauty of treating dry eye and doing it this way, you're no longer treating symptoms. And in fact, some of the patients that we have are have very, very few symptoms. Yet, once they see their images, they get it and they will accept your treatment protocols without showing them what's happening with their eyes, without demonstrating to them what's happening to their eyes. They're very unlikely to accept anything that you say. You tell them they have dry eye and they don't feel bad, so they're not really going to necessarily accept that. But when they look at 
what's happening actually happening with their own eyes, that is a very, very powerful image for them. And that's why I say I really like the keratograph. And it really is the gateway into our dry eye treatment program. Okay, so now you saw both of those videos, one right after the other, and even though I showed a, a couple of the same scans, understand that the patient hadn't seen those scans one right after another. They may have been several weeks to a month before they had seen them. I also like to repeat, especially things like the redness score, because that can change. It could have been that they just had a rough night, as I said earlier in the video, and I want to see if that's really a consistent issue. So let's talk about my one-year results. And patient satisfaction has absolutely increased. It's nice having happy dry eye patients. Uh, most of our colleagues would, I mean, they'll cringe and say, uh, you know, if I have to see another dry eye patient, I think I'll, I want to shoot myself. Um, I'm, we're getting better cataract surgery outcomes. We pre-treat all of our cataract surgery uh, patients before making the referral for cataract surgery, assuming they have a need for it. This has increased our gross 19%, and this is without adding any new patients. These are our existing patients. You gotta understand that you, if you're running a dry eye program, you're netting at close to 80%. Uh, there's nothing else you're gonna do in optometry that's gonna have that kind of net. Net, practice net increased 60%. Even if it's only 23% of my, 22% of the practice at an 80% net, that's increased our, our overall net tremendously. It's enabled me to add an associate and enabled me to reduce my own personal work schedule from five days a week down to four. So I'm gonna give you a few pearls. If you remember nothing else, these are your take home messages. This is the stuff that if you do this, you're gonna be successful. Number one, screen absolutely everyone. And you know, it really hit home today. I have um, a patient today, a 66 year old female patient. She was in for her third IPL and she was thrilled with the results. And she thanked me for questioning her on her first visit and for showing her the screening images. She told me that originally she didn't voice any complaints because she just assumed that, well, it's just part of getting older. Her tear meniscus height was normal. Uh, she had some oil present in her, um, in her tear film, but the screening showed a, a very high redness score of 1.8 and significant meibomian gland dropout. She didn't bother to mention those symptoms because she'd lived with them for so long that she just began to accept that they were a normal and that's the way she's supposed to feel. But she thanked me today. and I, I asked her if she wanted to appear on tonight's broadcast. Um, <laughs> it's as though I had paid her to say that, but I didn't. Uh, but that's really the issue. There are so many of these patients who are just in your chair now. They're not voicing their concerns because they just assume it's natural and normal and you're missing out on them. And I've learned the hard way because I used to miss out on them too. Bring them back for full dry eye evaluation and charge for your time. This is the other real important one. Forget the sales pitch. I've had so many colleagues say, well, how do you get them to buy your, your treatment protocols? I don't get them to buy anything. I teach them, I show them their own images. I can't overemphasize how powerful that is. When you see it's your eyes on the screen, especially for women with the redness score, they don't like their eyes to look red. Men don't seem to care all that much but are my eyes really that red? You know, it's when they see the, the gland loss, when they see the rapid breakup time, and you can equate that rapid breakup time with their fluctuating vision. And they can see it, the Myers on that 
on the screen are going to blur after a couple of seconds and they get it. They just truly understand. So you really want to educate them. And again, show and tell. Let the images do the talking. Those images are super powerful. And that's how you avoid becoming a salesman. Schedule them for any needed treatment on another date. I don't treat them on the day they come in for the dry eye eval. Because quite frankly, that would just blow my schedule. And um, we, bring, we schedule them back. And we tr do try to get them in relatively quick. Because now at this point, we've given them hope that there is something that's going to help them. And they are anxious for this. Remember, don't. this is a rookie mistake. <laughs> Um, dry eyes chronic, don't promise cures, all right, because you're going to fail. And this other one is really, really key. As you treat dry eye before making a cataract consult, your cataract surgeons are going to love you for this because their outcomes are going to be better. The patients are going to be happier, especially post surgical patients, because they went in feeling good and, and whatever issues they might have had after, after cataract surgery are gonna be mitigated by having a really, really solid tear film. Any questions? Perfect, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Ruszewski. We do have a number of questions waiting for you, uh, but before I get started on asking you those questions, I'll take a moment to remind everyone watching uh, that you can go ahead and enter in your questions now. And I just wanna thank you all for being here. All right. So the first question I have for you, I have a few questions on this actually, okay. is uh, do you charge for that screening that you do on everyone? No, the screening is part of our standard exam. We just incorporated it into our uh, comprehensive exam procedures, and there is no additional charge for it. Uh, I know that I have some colleagues who do charge separately for it. I just think this is, it's been so successful for me, I'm not about to change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and what percentage? For the dry eval, that there is a charge for that. For the complete for the comprehensive examination yes. gotcha okay and of the patients that you find a kind of a need to come back what percentage of your patients that go through the screening you find that need come back for that comprehensive testing pretty much everyone that we screen and if if they're if we see that there's an issue they're coming back for an evaluation i i i have to tell you that these days about 70% of my clinic time is spent seeing dry eye patients. Uh, and that wasn't that way a year and a half, two years ago. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of practice time. but That is a lot I of practice time. Patients. And it has really yeah. changed the, the entire face of my practice. Uh, I rarely ever do comprehensive exams anymore because uh, I just don't have time. I, I do spend my time really almost 100% with dry eye, ortho K, myopia control, and scleral specialty lenses. Great. Uh, that's actually a question that I had here, is uh, how often do you end up using sclerals in your dry eye treatments? That's a good question. I, it's not a common uh, use, but it does work, and it works exceptionally well. I do it. I don't, I don't know about how I would quantify how often. Uh, typically, uh, I'm doing more procedural-based treatments, in-office procedural-based treatments. Um, my own personal opinion is that IPL has been just a complete game changer. Uh, and um, so, yeah, that, but we we have it all. We have everything here. Uh, the only thing we I don't have here is radio frequency, um, and that may be next. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Uh, here I have a really interesting question about the consistency of exams because you mentioned the consistency of the retina scan. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of exams do you find to be really consistent indicators and which exams do you find to be a bit more variable? Okay, well, I already showed you the ones that I depend on. And, and as I said in there, um, 
I used to do a whole bunch more scans. The things I would like to have my techs do are fluorescein videography. Uh, that's a very powerful way to show breakup time. But I find that I don't want them putting that fluorescein without me being present. I really would rather do that personally. Um, really, the keys for you have to understand that although there are many, many different root causes for dry eye, in the senior population, virtually 100% of them are going to have some meibomian gland issue and mostly caused or in, in concert with blepharitis. And, you know, whatever's going to show me those things, looking at that oil layer is, is key for me. So is the redness score, uh, looking at the lid margins, looking at um, breakup time. And those are, those are my favorites and the mybography, of course. Uh, you know, things that are going to be, that'll make sense to a lay person, that they could look at it and see, gee, this, that's what a normal looks like and that's what I look like. Oh, wow, they get it. And while I'll use it diagnostically, I really think the the you the biggest benefit I mean is is being able to put this these images together in a clear concise and cogent fashion that makes it really really simple to demonstrate to the patient this 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 and you're telling them the story of their dry eye you're connecting their symptoms that whether or not they've even told you I can't begin to tell you how many times I will tell a patient without asking them what their symptoms are, what they're, you know, what's going on. And they're looking at me like, well, how did you know that? And it could have been a patient I just met. So it really is that show and tell that really does work. Uh, it's, it's very simple. Great. So to kind of dig a little bit kind of more specifically there, when you take the mybography exam and you follow up later, you find kind of those, uh, you know, you find the scans that you take to be kind of consistent and repeatable. Um, yeah, or yeah absolutely. For my, certainly for my biography, um, I would love to see improvement in my biography at post-treatment, but we don't typically see that. Uh, you know, I, I use, I like to use an OSDI. Uh, and I, I don't use it in the same way that most other practitioners do. My, my techs will do the OSDI on every dry eye visit, at every treatment visit. So for instance, IPL is a series of four treatments, typically. Today's patient, the lady I alluded to earlier, um, when she never bothered to tell me about any symptoms, she'd never complained of dry eye, she never complained about blurring, no complaints about grittiness, nothing. But when we did this, the uh, screening on her and we showed it to her and then I started asking her a couple of questions, she was like, yeah, I do have that. And, yeah, I do. and so she scheduled and she came back a couple of weeks later for the full dry eye eval. And that's when it started to come out from her. Well, yeah, I do have that and I do have that. And her OSDI was 33. Now she came back today and her OSDI was two. Um, that's today she was in for her third IPL. So just after two IPL and I have reducing doing other things as well. Uh, but I use the OSDI. I don't go through OSDI scores with patients. Typically will my text will take it. I won't even discuss it with the patient, but when they come back and before I walk into that exam room, let's say they're coming in for their second or third, in this case today was her third IPL. I already know what today's OSDI score is. And so I'll walk in the room and she was different because she's virtually zero uh, symptoms now. But very often, maybe they'll go from a, a 30 down to a, a 12 and they're still feeling symptoms. And if I ask how you're feeling, they're going to tell, give me a litany of symptoms. But it's different. It's, and then this is maybe psychological. I'll walk into that room and I'll say, Wow, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, you know, you, your OSDI was 30 last time. You're only 12 today. You're doing so much better. 
instead of asking her if she's doing better, I'm telling her she's doing better. And she gets real happy because it's a score. All right. And maybe it's psychological, but it, it helps. And patients really do appreciate that. They don't always remember, especially with IPL, because it's a month between treatments. They don't really remember exactly how they felt a month ago. So that's how I use that. Awesome. That actually perfectly leads us into our next question, which is when do you recommend IPL? Okay, well, that, that actually is changing. In um, I, two weeks ago, we took in LLLT. Uh, I'm in Myrtle Beach. IPL, you really have to be careful with sun exposure because it can photoactivate the skin. And um, so for summertime, that's really the reason why I took in LLLT. It doesn't have the same restrictions with sun exposure. But anytime that I feel that there's inflammation there, I don't need to have ocular rosacea, although that is certainly an indication for IPL. But anytime there's inflammation there, I'm going to do uh, IPL. You know, so I, I think of this in terms of um, we want to treat any bacterial load first because that's really just pushing this disease further and further. So there might be some hygiene or blethex or something like that. Um, we want to quell inflammation. That's second is quelling inflammation. And that's going to be something like IPL or possibly LLLT. And third, I want to maybe think about cleaning out those glands. And that would be a heating and expression, whether it's tear care or lipoflow or LLLT, which you will heat and you can express manually. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's kind of my har hierarchy of thinking. Great. I actually have one more set of questions about the biofilm specifically. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Blefax as a way to kind of debride the lid and kind of get that buildup of biofilm off of there. Correct. But what do you recommend to patients kind of between, you know, the months or potentially, you know, six months or a year between uh, screenings or checkups um, for dry eye? How do you get that biofilm to stay away? Like, what do you recommend to your patients? Great question. So uh, I, I really have come to be a true believer in um, Dr. James Reinerson's work on Deb's dry eye blepharitis syndrome. And really, you know, very often we'll look at lids. Like I showed, I'm going to go, well, no, I can't go back because it's in the video. The blepharitis that we all think of when we think of blepharitis, we think of just masses of, of flakes on lids and, oh, yeah, that's blepharitis. But that's end-stage blepharitis. Blepharitis begins very insidiously, and it might just be this sheen across the lid margin. And you, you kind of have to get to look for it. In the keratograph, if you look very carefully, you're going to see along the, the lash line a lightening of the skin. And that really is the onset of blepharitis. It's already working. That bacteria gets, bacteria alone gets into the meibomian glands, causes chronic low-grade inflammation. So we'll do Blefex in office or AB Max. You can't get that in the United States anymore, but I happen to have it still. Um, but in between visits, I will have them use a lid scrub, usually use a tea tree oil-based product. Uh, my own personal favorite is, um, is IECO's product. Um, and we, I like to recommend that they do it in the shower because the heat from the hot water is their friend, the heat and the steam. And I recommend that they, they have it be the last thing they do in the shower so that you have time for that hot water to work. Have them bring a clean four by four gauze pad into the shower with them, a couple of pumps of foaming cleanser on there, uh, vigorously scrub along the lash line for about 20 to 30 seconds per eye, rinse it off. When they get out of the shower, they pat it dry. And then I use a hypochlorous spray uh, immediately afterwards. And I really find that makes a huge difference for patients. Prior to doing the home scrubbing, we were doing Blefex two or three times a year. And while that might be a good revenue stream, it's really not fair to the patient. And it's there are, there are better ways to do it. I like to equate Blefex with going to the dentist for a dental cleaning but you still brush your teeth at home, all right? You still need to do some home therapy. 
men don't like doing it for the most part because men don't like homework. Women will do pretty much anything because they're far more cooperative usually. Um, but I can tell you that if they start doing it, it feels very refreshing. It's almost like if you didn't brush your teeth for a day and then you brush them the next day and how clean your mouth feels, your lids get to feel that way. Absolutely. That actually sounds quite refreshing indeed. <laughs> All right. I have uh, kind of one final question for you. Sure. Um, and it's going to be a short one. You mentioned kind of the fluorescein imaging um, mm -hmm. and kind of the blink video. Do you also use it for partial blinks? And uh, do you like assess the patient's blinking patterns? Yeah, so, and, and I didn't show it in the video. If you when I, um, during the dry eye eval, I put a little caption on top that said incomplete blinker. That patient was an incomplete blinker. What One of the things I love about the keratograph is there there is um, a button on there that you can push to slow down that video and capture. You can cut it half speed. You can cut it quarter speed. And what typically I'll do when I see that, the patients don't always see it, I'll take my mouse cursor and I'll just put it right where I think that lid is stopping. And I'll tell them, and I'll have them watch it, and oh yeah, it is stopping there. They see that it doesn't go all the way down. Um, and that you can do with just the, the lipid layer uh, video. But yeah, it is, it is helpful to do it with fluorescein video. Um, just my awesome. techs don't always know everything to do. They don't know all the little ins and outs that the doctor would know for utilizing those the vital dyes. So mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful performance, Dr. Wyshevsky. And I just want to take a moment to thank everyone that submitted questions and just everyone for coming here tonight and watching. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyshevsky. Thank you very much. I uh, hope everyone has a great evening. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. On behalf of Oculus, have a good night. Thank you. You too.